Everyone going? Good. Okay. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, open the eyes of my heart that I may hear your word and understand and do your will, for I am a sojourner upon the earth. Hide not your commandments from me, but open my eyes, that I may perceive the wonders of your law. Speak unto me the hidden and secret things of your wisdom. On you do I set my hope, O my God, that you shall enlighten my mind and understanding with the light of your knowledge, not only to cherish those things which are written, but to do them that in reading the lives and sayings of the saints I may not sin, but that such may serve for my restoration, enlightenment, and sanctification, for the salvation of my soul and the inheritance of life everlasting. For you are the enlightenment of those who lie in darkness, and from you comes every good deed and every gift. St. Matthew, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, yes, it's, it's going. Thank you for double-checking. If it's not, it's his fault. <laughs> it's very good. So, um, I started a minute late, so that means with interest I get five extra minutes. You know, we're learned, draw from those payday loans. You know, we learned something there. Um, so tonight, uh, we kind of get into some of the more visual, exuberant, some of the real strong imagery of Revelation begins. Uh, so I thought, rather than trying to put something up on the whiteboard, drew from some of the images and illustrations and artwork that ver people have done over, really over the decades, over the centuries, to really interpret and give us this vision that John had. So that's what's been playing on these slides. You're just taking a handful. And one of the things that I find interesting about it, and not unsurprising, and this we'll get into when we talk about uh, Ezekiel and Daniel also, is these are all taken from the very same text but yet in some ways and some places are very different. And at the same time, they may be very different from one another, but we can look at them and say, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, and I, yeah, so and I said, we'll, get, we'll see that with Daniel and, and Ezekiel, this idea that when God gives his prophets a vision, that challenge of putting it into words, of trying to describe. I mean, if we can even just try and imagine if we were shown heaven, how, how do you put that into words? That great and wonderful reality. Okay. So one, I'm going to pause here so you're not distracted. I, th I think you all got the point there. Uh, because I'm also going to be using the whiteboard, I need the super wide. Um, and actually, if you could figure out how to turn that projector off, may, it may go off on its own. There we go. See, this is... <laughs> this is why we are each called and have our own, our own gifts and talents. The, so talking about the vision of heaven, I was reminded of several years ago, um, actually a, a first date that I went on, because I'd seen this movie and Cuba Gooding Jr. was, was uh, promoting it, he and Robin Williams, you think, great, got to be a wonderful comedy, right? Worst date movie ever for a first date, okay? It was called What Dreams May Come. And it, it is a very tragic movie. And, and this isn't about the theology that it follows, as it follows a family that essentially dies, the entire family. But what's striking about it is the image of heaven that it gives. And one of the lines is, 
that Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character gives. He's someone that had died long ago to the recently arrived Robin Williams character is, you know, to the effect of, I've seen a lot of great paintings of heaven, but no one who's ever actually used paint. Because the idea is that heaven is what you make it. And the character who had died had made heaven out of the painting of, that his wife had made. And he really used, it was actually little, literal paint. And how common is this, I think, in our age that we've developed the sense of what heaven looks like and what it is. That it's become what we make it to be and what we want. Well, Revelation, so John gets this vision of heaven one thing to keep in mind is this is his vision of heaven and that real that insight that he is taken up into that spirit and what he sees is not what he wants what he sees is this act of divine worship and it's very similar very similar to visions shared by the prophets of the old testament so in addition to the message that it intends to give us, they also kind of serve, I think, as a validation and proof that the prophet's role is one who has been given insight and a divine ability to see the reality behind the corporal events that are taking place. The primary ones we're talking about in Revelation is this connection to the vision of Dan the prophet Daniel, and also the prophet Ezekiel. And on here is one of the handouts that I gave you, and I did not keep one for myself. Um, I think I can make do without it, though. Is It has on one hand of the column a printout. It is from this book, Coming Soon, that parallels Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Revelation, with Daniel. And what we say is that this is a fulfillment and completion of that vision. And what it is, is the prophets were looked at and they were taken away up into the Spirit. And God wanted to show them what the reality of heaven was. And there are some differences in the details. And that's why I liked having the different paintings too, that we would expect there to be some differences. Some may want to argue and say, well... In Ezekiel, the four living creatures don't each have one face, but each one has a face of a man, a face of an ox, a face of a lion, and a face of an eagle. A four-headed being of some sort. Okay. And there are these variations, so it's a, well, some people accuse say, well, then that really wasn't heaven. That was just something they made up. But as we, law enforcement and lawyers would agree, when you have eyewitness testimonies, you actually, will, if they're all the same, if they're following, it's like they're following a script and they're forcing into that. But the fact that there are some differences and little turns adds to the authenticity that this is what they experienced and that this is what they saw. It also points that there would be that there's a difference to the message. If the vision is God revealing himself and wanting to communicate something specifically to the people of the time and then on down through the ages, well, depending on the time and the century, the condition of the community, the message is probably going to be a little bit different that he's wanting to communicate. So this also comes out. And then there's also that idea of perspective. That how many of us can look at the exact same thing and we would describe it a little bit differently. Okay. So the differences we would say actually enhance and help us to go through and tease out more of what the message is. Okay. And they've described it as Williamson gets really heavy into this also, is commonly described as a continuation or fulfillment of the prophecies in Daniel and Ezekiel. 
So tonight I'm actually, we could spend the time focusing on that. I'm going to say for further reading, if you want to go in, that's why I gave you the printed sheets there that shows Daniel on one side, and also the e parallels of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation on the other side. Okay, To go in for further reading, but there is a big, there is, so there's continuation and fulfillment, that tie to the Old Testament. But there is one very big difference. Okay. The presence of the Lamb who was slain. It's a new character. If you remember the first week, I, I wrote the, several different key characters, one of them being the Lamb. So if the Lamb is Jesus Christ, then it makes sense that in Daniel and Ezekiel, God hasn't fully revealed. The veil is still there. Okay. Heaven hasn't come into that fullness of what salvation is going to be, so He's holding back. And the church fathers even talk about that when it comes to the prophets and the way of perfection versus righteousness. I could really tail off here, and some of you are snickering because you know I could is that God actually held the prophets back from perfection, from that higher way of loving and uni unity with Him. Then notice that Moses did not get to see the face of God. It was within the cloud. Elijah, when God came to him in the cave and passed by, Elijah covers his face. So that neither of them, and we're talking about Moses and Elijah. You're not going to get any higher with the law or the prophets than these two. Or stronger in their love and unity of God. It was not until the transfiguration on Mount Tabor that they got to see the face of the Son of God. So when we look at that difference, that movement, that's the big change. What Revelation fully revealing what Daniel and Ezekiel started to see now in that heavenly worship with the strange living creatures and the elders worshiping and proclaiming God is that the arrival of the Lamb marks the fulfillment. And through Him, through the Lamb, now we're going to get to see the mysteries can be unrolled as though the seals can be broken so that we can now read what's written on the scroll. But that's kind of eking into next week. On that. Okay. This vision is also where is the linchpin most of the time for the understanding of the rapture. That as John was taken up into heaven in the Spirit, that so will all of the faithful. There is nothing, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but just to address this, because it is a very common and very heavy, there's a lot of movies and literature on this, and it's an important point to be able to engage in the conversation when that theology of rapture and the tribulation and the suffering times, and using the book of Revelation to predict that chronology of events comes in, sometimes we've got to be able to say, well, raise some points. This is apologetics. Okay. One is, rapture is, never, is, is a word not used. But we have better reasons than that. Okay. There is nothing in the text that would indicate or suggest that John is becoming an example or type for all Christians. No indication that others are being taken up into heaven. Nothing that indicates other than this is his personal, intimate experience with our Lord. And if we do follow in that tradition, if this is a completion or continuation of the prophets of Daniel and Ezekiel's vision, then it would make sense that just as Daniel's vision wasn't a prediction of a rapture, or Ezekiel's wasn't, but an actual description of God's intimate coming to the prophets to unveil and open the vision of heaven, that John falls right in that tradition. 
that this is his vision to share with us. Okay. The other thing is that that interpretation contradicts what we hear throughout Revelation later. Okay. What it hinges on is we'll take what we talked about last week in the letters to the seven churches. It interprets that as there's a period of the church. And this describes the ages of the church. And then you have the rapture where all of the faithful are taken up to heaven. So all that remains are those who deny God. Well, there gets a problem when throughout Revelation, number one, it talks about the faithful who remain on earth and in the world. If they've been taken up to heaven, where do they come from? But even more, I would say, it undermines one of the central messages that John gives. Because he's addressing the churches facing the churches that are facing persecution and struggle and suffering throughout. And he's giving them that message to endure that suffering. So that's a key part. A key part that he's telling us is that the church does suffer as part of salvation. We do undergo persecution. We will undergo times of tribulation because it's not a punishment. It's the same as Christ dying on the cross. His suffering, his tribulation was for the salvation of the world just as the church undergoes that same suffering and martyrdom for the salvation of the world. I'm going to pause here. might be a good time if there are a couple of questions. So that, he is describing, one could be the final day of judgment, but within the context, he gives that warning of, you know, like a thief coming in the night. Okay. And what he describes, though, is also, but you are not children of the night, you are children of the light and have nothing to fear. So it's mainly hitting on that point of if you have faith, you don't have to worry about the thief coming. You don't know when it's going to happen. Be virtuous, be good, continue to follow in the commandments of Christ. And if you do that, then there is nothing to be anxious over, or to be fearful over. Um, and it is also drawing out that fact that just because do you, someone is your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband, if they do not accept Christ, then in that sense they will be left behind. Does that help? Yes, okay. So, seven, okay, question about the seven spirits of God being something new coming across. So, times called the seven spirits, the sevenfold spirit, um, the candelabra that sits in front of the throne with the seven flames, seven being that image of the fullness. This is the holy, a reference to the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the vision of heaven that John has given, like Daniel and Ezekiel, is reality. It's not just signs and symbols alone. The would say is, in the Spirit, when you're in the Spirit, you have the eyes that see reality and what God does for the prophets. And again, that is they gives them a vision of re, a deeper vision of reality of the mystery so that they can then go and share with the people. Okay. So what we'd say is the heavenly throne he sees is reality itself. 
But of course, it doesn't mean that heaven is physically a throne where God is sitting. God the Father. That it's physically encircled by a rainbow and surrounded by the 24 smaller thrones on which 24 elders with bowls of incense sit. But what it is, is, again, what's happening? God is wanting to reveal Himself. He's wanting to reveal that reality. So He does this through symbolic images that we can understand. So there, it can be a li- sometimes it may feel like we're walking a little bit of a fine line. We're saying it's reality and it's not symbolic, but yet it's symbolic. Okay. But it's an expression of the reality of God that comes into a corporeal form that we can understand. So it's not just God thinking, choosing, hmm, what, what do I want to use here? Well, you know, when after the flood I used a rainbow, I think it's a good idea. Let me do that. It's like the sacraments, that there is an underlying reality that we cannot see that God expresses in a physical, visible way for us to see. So it could not come any other way, any other form. Um, does, Does that help or confusing? And it may be a little clearly when, when we talk about, and I want, we'll go through some of the symbols and, and what they actually mean. Because again, this is the revelation of God unveiling reality for us so that we can see it and comprehend it. So in a novel move, we're going to turn straight to the text. And and as I go through it, okay, so I am going to read from the Dewey Rims version. It's going to sound more like King James and a little bit different. Okay, But as we go through it, then I will try and pull out some of the meaning that we can see here. So beginning with chapter 4. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Pretty straightforward. And the first voice which I heard, which is going back to the angel, as it were a trumpet speaking with me. So the trumpet, like the host of angels announcing the birth of Christ, okay, is this grand, beautiful announcement, so that all around. It's an encompassing voice all can hear. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, there was a throne set in heaven, and upon the throne one setting. And he that sat was to the sight like the jasper and sardine stone, which you probably have carnelian. So jasper And this is why I wanted to make sure you had the sheets. Um, You probably can't read my mom, what she describes as chicken scratching. So that's why I didn't make copies for you. The um, jasper is a stone that was found in the Garden of Eden. And it was a stone particularly of healing. And what... um, Michael Barber points out is it was also one that was feared, he says, by phantoms and wild beasts. So later on we'll get into this image, we'll touch upon more imagery of things that are fearful to those who oppose God and those that are healing and comforting to those who love Him. But the jasper and carnelian is one that they're stones that were also worn by the high priest when entering the sanctuary. A hearkening back to the Garden of Eden, of paradise. So the highest of high priests is one who is sitting on the throne. 
which means that when the high priest on earth wears, they're wearing in reflection of our Lord in heaven. Because that's the other thing that's happening. If what John is seeing is reality, then we try to imitate or reflect it down here. It's not the other way. It's not that what we do down here, suddenly the prophet has a vision and it's up in heaven to reinforce. But the message is, this is reality in heaven and now we're trying to capture and reflect and catch a shadow of that on earth. And we can. Like Jasper and the Sardine Stone. The other note here I almost lost. On Jasper is a light green. Described as a color of pale green. That is life giving. And bestows divine food. So again, a touch of this is the creator that has the true fruit of life to give. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. So a rainbow harkens back to the promise of a new creation. Again, after the flood for Noah, that this, this is a new creation. Andrew of Caesarea points out that it represents also the angelic orders that are surrounding the throne. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats four and twenty ancients sitting. So these twenty-four elders the immediate things come to mind, that reference to the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, give us the 24, representing all of the people of God. But another point that has been drawn out is that if we look in 1 Chronicles, King David established 24 divisions of priests. So a hint that Okay, the divisions of priests, again, carry over from the Old Testament continuation. Not that, that because of what we do here, but the reason that King David was inspired by the Spirit for 24 divisions of priests is because there are 24 seats around the throne of God. And these 24 were clothed in white garments, and on their heads were crowns of gold. So the white, white garments, we could immediately say, I think, brilliant life. They're spotless and free from sin, as there is no sin in heaven. That are a ref they are reflected in the baptismal garment as well. The garment of a priest. And then we have the gold crowns which symbolize victory. And again, the letters and the letters John always promised to those who persevere, he mentioned, indicated a form of reward would be given. So naturally in heaven this is the reward, the sign of victory and a kingly nature. So that the elders show elements of priest and kingship. And there's an element of prophets. In the, what we see later in the vision as they praise God and offer the prayers and have the bowls, that they have that role of priest, prophet, and king. Which again, we reflect those baptismal identities that we receive as priest, prophet, and king. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and voices and thunders, which we know is the presence of God. Thinking back to Mount Sinai, particularly strong there. 
And this is one place where we can see to those, we'd say the enemies of God, those who do not love God, the lightning, the thunder, the loud peals, maybe the earthquake, frightening and terrifying. But to those who love God, not frightening to Moses, but that signs of His presence that we know in our love for Him become very comforting. In this contrast, I think we can say, is also present in the symbols of fire and wine. So going to other places in Scripture, okay, fire, sevenfold spirit, the Holy Spirit, eyes like fire, meaning the eyes that see truth and see all, so comforting to those who love God. But then you have the flames of Gehana, the fire that is never quenched, the painful that burns those who hate God or are opposed to God. Okay. Wine, the wine of new life, the new wineskin, the wine of the new covenant, their forgiveness of sins, the wine that becomes the blood of Christ that we must drink to receive everlasting and eternal life. But then we also have the image of God's the wrath of God's wine press and crushing out those who oppose them. So I think even other places and throughout, there's this play and the symbols that draw out that they are fearsome to those who oppose and enlightening to those who love God. And in the thunder and lightning and the presence of God, it gives us that promise that not only is that coming from the throne in heaven to say this is God's presence, but it tells us that the presence is real on earth as well. Not just a sign that makes us think of and remember, but that is true presence. And there were seven lamps burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, which we've already spoken about. So good question. A sign of the Holy Spirit. So right now we have, we've seen the, the Father sitting on the throne. We have the Holy Spirit that is in front of the throne. So we would guess we're going to get the Son in the near future. He's coming. And in the side of the throne was, as it were, a sea of glass like to crystal. Two very different and interesting things that has been, this has been interpreted about. One is that as you can imagine, go back to the beginning when you had the dome separating the heavens and the earth, that it was almost a clear dome because we can see through it, right? What might that look if we're looking down on it, but almost as a sea of glass? And it also prom gives that sense of a promise of tranquility. So in heaven, there is peace. There is, you know, I guess there's no deeper word than that. There is peace. The other is drawing again to this idea that we reflect. Because you remember back to Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was constructed as a reflection of the temple that Ezekiel saw in heaven. And in front of the Holy, Holy, Holy of Holies was a brass laver that had that surface clear like glass. So he's building a reflection of the heavenly throne 
on earth for us to see. And in that, okay, this, the disclaimer is this is me thinking now, not from notes. But if you just think about, okay, what was the purpose of that, bra, that bronze laver? Okay, laver, espanol, lavar, to wash, that the priest would cleanse his hands, purify before going into the Holy of Holies. As the human soul ascends from death and earth up to heaven, go through the laver, the laver, the cleanser, to be purified and cleansed of all sins, just as we do, and just as the priest does in that time of the Eucharistic prayer, when the priest turns his back to you and whispers something that you all can never hear, wash me of my sins, O Lord, and cleanse me of my iniquities. I spilled the secret. There you go. Okay. So even at that moment, even though we've done that penitential rite beforehand and should be cleansed of sin, we remember that washing, that purification from the life-giving water. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. Full of eyes before and behind. So this harkens back to the cherubim of Ezekiel's vision. And as I mentioned kind of in the beginning, he pictured there were four creatures he described. Each one had four heads. In Revelation, John describes each of the four has a distinct head. One of a lion, one of a calf, one of an eagle, one of a man. Okay. But the eyes, and the cherubim are those who, it's the second rank of angels. And I probably should draw on the board right now, but I think that would distract me too much. Okay. You have the throne, the first rank are the seraphim. And Isaiah the prophet talks about the seraphim. And the seraphim are always looking to God. God is never out of their sight. They're never looking away. They are the first creature that is closest to God. That's distinct and different from God. And their attention is never drawn away. The cherubim are the second rank. So they're the first ones that have an outward movement to physical creation, to the heavens and to the earth. And that's one reason why Ezekiel describes, and in, they have, they're on these very difficult to paint and describe chariots with four wheels so that they can move in any direction without having to stop and turn. Okay. They're kind of that first link that has one hand to the divine and one hand towards the creation. And their eyes all covered means a couple things. One is the eye is used often to describe insight and wisdom and knowledge. So being all over means all knowing. And also they always have God in their vision and sight and they always have man in their sight no matter how they may turn. Okay. The seraphim always have God in their sight, but maybe not man. Just a distinction in there. There's no, there's no, if you want to say the value in that is to always have God in your sight is to never be distracted by created things. So these are the cherubim that he's describing. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second living like a calf, and the third living creature having the face, as it were, of a man, and the fourth living creature was like an eagle flying. These, I have some notes on the handout that I gave you at the end of them. So these are the seraphim that are always in God's divine light, 
the one like a lion. And I wanted to bring down, I just didn't have a good way to display it. So if you've seen my red vestments that the sisters in Gower made for me, they had it ready the night before Pentecost this past year. On the back are four medallions. Okay. It's these four living creatures. That the lion, okay, and, and the collection from Barber, Andrew of Caesarea, and Williamson looks at these and interprets them in a few different ways, seeing virtues and identity of Christ. Tradition has always seen them as the evangelists, as a certain task of the church, and indicating a certain aspect of creation. So in the lion, we see bravery. And in the calf, we see righteousness. In the eagle, prudence. And in the man, intellect. Which would say four cardinal virtues. And if you have these four, that represents a fullness. There is also the rank of angels, which are called the virtues. Then, an identity of Christ. So the lion represents kingliness, royalty. Calf, the sacrifice, so a priest. The eagle, that life-giving spirit that goes forth. And man, for our sake. For the sake of man. So an embodiment, not so much an embodiment, but if all creation came through Christ and nothing was created that was not created through Him, you're going to get I guess, some feeding, some resonance, some residue from that. So in these four cherubim, you see the four key identities of Christ that they've pulled from him. Now when it comes to the evangelists and interpreting which one is which, if you get confused and can't remember, as long as you give a good reason, you're right. <laughs> there is nothing in Scripture that says, traditionally now we take the lion as Mark, there's nothing in Scripture that says Mark is the lion. And in the beginning, the first few centuries, the church fathers had different meanings and different interpretations. Some would de describe Matthew as the lion. And I think John as the man. Okay? But they'd have different reasons. It was universally accepted that they did represent the evangelists. The word, those who would take the word out to the ends of the earth, which is the task of the cherubim. Okay. Long, so for centuries now, we have kind of settled on this that the lion is Mark, the calf or the ox is Luke, the, the eagle is John, and the man is Matthew. So it's a good day to be a man. Or a person. That's my plug to say Matthew. Okay. Um, in terms of task of the church. So remember the characters we have. The church is a main one. The Lamb. God, the church, and the Lamb. The church has the apostolic authority. Is seen in the Lion. The power and strength. From the calf, that image of sacrifice, the sacrifice of martyrs. The eagle, that call to evangelize the nations to go forth. And then the one with the face of a man, that is the object of the church. The purpose of the church, the responsibility of the church, the work of the church, is to be directed toward the salvation of mankind. I was noticing I got about 14 minutes left, so I'm going to 
there, there's some more things I want to get through here. Okay. The four living creatures had each of them six wings. Swift flight. Again, so they, they can go in any direction without having to turn. And round about and within, they are full of eyes. And they rested not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And I'll come back to this note of praise here in a little bit. I'm going to skip down because I want to hit a few more points on the symbolism. So then the next big thing we get to is, in chapter 5, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and without, sealed with seven seals. Most commonly described a scroll. A scroll written within and without. So the scroll is, of course, a very common occurrence with the prophets. That this is the word of God the word of prophecy that they are being given to pronounce. In this context, it's also been interpreted as a sign of the covenant. So this being a new covenant. And when the seals are broken from it, that means the new covenant takes full effect for eternity. It is, represents the Word of God, and it is, represents an account of the history of salvation. And this we take more from as we read on throughout, as we see the contents of the scroll and what they seem to be indicated, it bears out that this is the fullness of salvation. And that it's written on both sides emphasizes the fullness. There is no room left. There is nothing left to say that now after the scroll is not unsaid. Bringing the fullness of the revelation of the Word of God, the fullness of the history of salvation, that all is contained in this scroll, and there will be nothing more revealed. There's not going to be a second or third scroll, but all here is revealed. And Andrew of Caesarea describes, and I did not know this until recently or see it, and to me it was very eye-opening. This idea of having on the inside and outside, so if it's on the outside, it's easy to read, it's easy to see, it's easy to understand. This is the literal meaning of scriptures or of the Word of God. This is the literal meaning of history that is easy for us to understand. But there's deeper. There's that that is inside that can't be seen. So these would be the greater mysteries of salvation. This would be a spiritual understanding and interpretation of sacred scriptures. Those things that you got to look a little bit harder to see and understand. And the seals. So we can think about what seals, what a seal does. So a seal prevents something from being read. And that usually it does that when it means that the person who reads it has some special place, some unique place of authority. And if this is a seal of, this is a scroll of the Word of God, then it's sealed so that only the one who it, boy, I lost the word, um, refers. I, I lose simple words sometimes. Only the one who, refers to or has the authority to pronounce it may actually open the seal. The seal is not broken 
until it is received by the one for whom it is intended. Okay. The seal also bears the mark of the author for proof of ownership. So if this is the Heavenly Father, this is God in His right hand holding the scroll that is sealed, it's a verification that this is His Word. It has His mark, His seal, His authority. John is telling the churches and Christians it is truth and you can accept it without question on faith. The faith that if this is God, if Christ rose from the dead, you can accept the words that are coming. That God has a plan for salvation. And when we get to the next chapters and we will see how they are opened very deliberately and in sequence. So the seal is meant to keep it that, yes, everything is planned, everything is known by the will of God. And there is a certain sequence to it, which also means, you know, how much more he is the author. Do not be anxious, do not be afraid, do not fear. And the seals keep things closed until it's proper time to open, until it's proper time to be revealed. I'm just doing a quick judgment on what we're going to cover in these last few minutes. Because I think it's clear the identity of the Lamb. The Lamb is Christ, the one who was slain and resurrected and raised from the dead. That He alone is worthy. No one before Him. Uh, Williamson points out the idea of the weeping. And you notice it gives this time sequence of there is a time where it is announced and there is great weeping because no one in heaven or on earth is found worthy. Well, where's the lamb then? You ever think of that? There actually seems to be a moment where no one's worthy. Well, where's the lamb? He's not in heaven. He's not on earth. Okay. Old Testament. Referring to that time before the Lamb arrived. Ezekiel's vision, Daniel's vision. The Lamb's not yet here. And the revelation of the Lamb is the one who is worthy. And when he arrives, he has seven horns and seven eyes. Horns being that sign, symbol of power. Seven Completeness and fullness. So fullness of power, yet he was slain. Eyes, again, being knowledge. And it describes the 24 elders with bowls of incense. The bowls being good works and pure prayer. That they're standing and offering to God who sits on the throne. These are the sacrifices of the faithful. We can also see a correlation with the incense that is burned in the old temple and even the, the tent of God's presence that out aside next to the ark of the covenant was the show, a table on which was the bread of the presence. You actually had within the Holy of Holies bread and wine that became later the body and blood of Christ. There's a beautiful prefigurement of that there. But next to the bread of the presence was the bowl of burning incense that was offered. So again, you have this, the temple, the sanctuary on earth, trying to reflect what was seen in the vision in heaven. Heaven being the reality. And it's not just 
that we paint an impressionistic image of it. It's not like we've seen one painting and we say, I love that, and we're not as good of artists as God is. We don't have the same paints. We don't have the precious stones at our disposal. We're not as talented. So our paltry paintings down here, yeah, we try because looking at them, they remind us of what's up there and the reality of heaven. But it is the actual entry into this heavenly divine worship that's taking place. When we sing in Mass, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of hosts, and we even say it in that prayer coming before, I say, you know, and with the choirs of angels and archangels, we proclaim. So in that moment, because again, the day and night part, not overlooking those little details, the four creatures, the elders, day and night without ceasing, are giving the praise and worship to God, means right in this very moment, means at 6.15 in the morning, they will be singing and praising and we enter into that that deeper reality that takes place. This is the vision that John is giving us, trying to open up for us what is true, what's really there. So short cliff notes on what God is revealing for us in this vision of heaven. Kind of putting together, we can put together a lot of the signs and the symbols and what they mean, that idea of a new creation, that eternity. Everything coming forth from the throne of God, it gives us a description of the ranks. Okay, so you have the angels surrounding God's throne, and then you have the elders. And the elders and the creatures participate in the same prayer, and you have a unification of heaven and earth, giving praise and worship to God. And C.S. Lewis, this is one of the other pages that I copied, uh, Williamson draws out and refers to what C.S. Lewis, he struggled. And we can even think of, you know, he said as a kid, but as an, a kid in the faith, thinking, I kind of like that image of heaven made with paint, that I can water ski and play baseball all day and go out to Yankee Stadium and maybe throw a perfect game and, you know, game seven of the World Series. Have everything I want to eat. Pray. They just sit around there and, they hold bowls of incense and offer words of praise. Well, that's not fun. But C.S. Lewis, he said he got to thinking, what do you do when you love someone? And they do something wonderful, give you a great gift. You praise them. That it's this natural outpour, love itself has a natural outpouring of praise. It's not a job that they have to do. What it is, is it's a sign and revelation that when we, that, that unification, that coming to the throne of God, we could not help just out of that love to give praise. We're not going to want to do anything else. It gives us the image of what our destiny is. It says in the beginning of the chapters, a vision of what is to come. It's saying this is what lies in your future. The new heaven and the new earth coming together in this vision of the heavenly throne. That our human destiny will be fulfilled in a return to the presence of God the destiny of salvation. I should have paused there I'm, uh, because it's a very different thought. It also reveals to us that salvation will not be fulfilled without the presence of the Lamb. There is no one in heaven and earth that could do what Jesus Christ did and accomplished what he accomplished tells us that the worship of God on earth is intended, and I mentioned this before, to not only be a shadow reflection of what occurs in heaven, 
but by mirroring what takes place, we enter into the life and events of what is actually happening. It's why Solomon's temple was built the way it was and given such instruction, that we enter into that reality that is taking place. I'll give an opportunity for a few questions. Mm -hmm. So the question, short synopsis of the question is, having a conversation and about someone who does not, does not believe in God, does not believe in Jesus Christ, whether or not they can go to heaven even if they've been a good person and don't sin. Okay. So all is in God's hands. That's, that's, the, that's the short answer. But it is a very good question because people want to say that and have this Attitude, it doesn't matter what I do because everyone's going to heaven. Just because, because. Why would God be mean and condemn anyone? And yet everything we say, says, no, there are some who don't, who oppose God, who refuse to believe or to accept. Now, I know a lot of self-professed atheists who after five minutes re can figure out they claim they don't believe in God, but they, there's a reason why they don't want to believe. That there's a great struggle in some pain in their life. That if there is a God, it seems like it almost becomes more painful. Why then would God do this? Why does he allow evil in the world? So I think most people who have some sense of goodness in them and may claim they don't believe in God, Actually, they do. Okay. And they may not realize. And God, that's what God knows. So, in reality, point blank, if there is a person who does not believe in God and has truly denied Christ, Scripture tells us no. But it would indicate, too, if someone is good and kind and generous, these are fruits of the Holy Spirit, so there's a suggestion there that there is some connection, some point of contact. You know, and I would lean towards that situation. It's a, they do, they're probably going to be spending a lot of time in purgatory because there's a lot of purification that's needing to be worked out and take place for them. But... No, no. So if you're separated from God, that's more of a description of hell because you're truly separated. Purgatory is described as a burning place with fires. This is the, this is the purging. This is the purification. And saints that have testified and have, you know, um, credible visions, that's what they describe because you've got sin that, like, the silver tried in a furnace, it is painful. The process of cleansing, it's not a punishment that God wants to say, you know, well, you sinned and you didn't go to confession, so I'm going to punish you. The natural process of removing those sinful parts from our soul and the effects of it is painful. It's God cutting those out of us you know so once you're in purgatory that's you, in a way you can celebrate okay yes i'm in purgatory because that there's no going to hell from purgatory purgatory is entirely cleansing for those who are going to heaven but not yet prepared they're not burning in the sense of being consumed okay cleansing cleansing fires Mm-hmm.
the impurities are getting burned out. So if someone's really attached to sin, they're still, we're wanting it, so it's painful. Okay. One, one more and then... Mm-hmm. She's mentioning, yeah, a reference in St. Faustina to praying for those in purgatory and how torturous. Yeah, that's why we pray for the, that's why we pray for the souls in purgatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Any more questions? You can stay, stay later. I have some time. Um, but let's just conclude by in commending um, in thanksgiving for what our Lord has given to us and commending these days and our week into the hands of our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And next week, we're looking at chapters 6, 7, and 8. 6, 7, and 8, breaking open the seals. So we will get into what the four horsemen mean. Dustin, could you?